Life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hello, and welcome to our last episode of December, mm -hmm. our last episode of 2020. Wow. This podcast, we will be talking about books, movies, TVs, games that we have been experiencing the past two weeks. We're going to talk about some lifestyle stuff. But also, if you are listening to us on YouTube, you should know that we are going to start transitioning into our brand new name, our brand new social media stuff, and it is called Elated Geek. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about Elated Geek and... I think one of the things that we're we're feeling is that we just kind of need to move from something that is just the Zany Laney brand, which is still going to be sticking around, mm -hmm. it, but we need to go into something that's more both of us. It's something that is you too. It's not just us geeking out about something, but we really want to bring you in on the joy. And obviously, right now, we are just talking about things that we're experiencing or things that we are liking. We want to try to bring in some guest yeah. uh, guest people. And we want to talk about stuff that you guys want us to talk about. So, that being said, uh, stick around till the end of the podcast. We'll tell you how you can be a part mm -hmm. of what we're going to do. And uh, give us a little bit of feedback about what you want. So, make sure you listen all the way to the end and that information will be there. But in the meantime, we will be doing our books December and 2020 mm -hmm. wrap up. That will be coming out next week. So. Yep. Stay tuned for that as well. And hopefully by that time, we will also have this posted on all of our podcasting platforms on mm -hmm. top of that. Yeah, we're going to be starting to podcast through Anchor, but we're going to be trying to branch out and make it where it's a little bit more available to other platforms. Exactly. So before we get started, we we wanted to talk about what what are you drinking? I mean, because usually we're drinking something. We are huge believers in drinking new things, trying new things out. So mm -hmm. we are both drinking the same tea because here in Florida, it is 40 degrees. Yeah. I have a friend who lives up in New York who told me that it's warmer in New York than it is down here right now. That is crazy. I might be freaking out. <laughs> yes. So we are trying out this winter wake-up tea from Trader Joe's. It says it is a spicy black tea blend with cinnamon and ginger. I don't normally like cinnamon teas. I feel like it is a little too spicy for me, but this is tasty. I normally am not a big fan of black tea, unless it's got a lot of flavoring thrown into it. I typically have to sweeten it a lot, and I'm having this straight. There is no stevia in here to sweeten it. Oh, it's, wow. it's fine, just as is. I usually do half a packet of stevia. I, unlike Marshall, I drink tea almost every day. It doesn't matter if it's cold or hot. Especially since working from home, I tend to be drinking more hot tea. So that is something you can look forward to. If you are a tea lover, we'll probably be bringing you more teas. But if you have a tea we think we should try, again, you can let us know. So let's talk about books. Of course, this is what we were reading the past two weeks. I have to say that I'm kind of in a book slump right now. Me and too. especially with the holidays, I just stopped being motivated reading which is sad because i have extra time off in which i could be reading yeah and i did not i had kind of a rough week so i don't have that many as normal yeah and i only had one book like it, it was kind of sad like all of this month we really only had four books for me at least oh yeah yeah and so i just finished one and that was a uh, if we were villains by ml rio and that was really interesting, mm -hmm. I felt like. We talked about it a little bit before when Lainey read it. Right. But I did, once I once I got past my own reading slump, I kind of burnt through it. And I found it very entertaining, uh, if a little difficult to get into early on. And it's that early early rise that made it so that it was more of a four star than a, than a five star for me. Right. That makes sense. I really liked the Shakespeare and the use of it and how the actors felt. Mm -hmm. It was really good. How do you feel about the dark academia genre as a whole? Are you really into like collegiate or educational settings 
with kind of a dark mystery around it. Are you into that? I kind of am. I mean, I really like... Okay, so Harry Potter is kind of like that because right. almost every single one of those books happens at a school. Uh, Truly Devious is like that. It's all happening in a school and the mystery is surrounding the school itself. I feel like you have to have something that is very different about the place in order to make it work. Right. It can't just be like, oh, well, here's a middle school. Another one that I really did enjoy was The Mystery of Alice, which took place in a, a high class school. Oh, interesting. And that was a big part of the plot line. Mm -hmm. I felt like it really worked there. So, yeah, I mean, I guess collegiate does does kind of resonate right. with me as long as the, the the school itself is interesting. So as far as the dark academia gen genre, though, um, if we were villains, it falls more under that. Whereas, like, Harry Potter, truly devious, not necessarily dark. Like, mm -hmm. dark means more sinister rather than mysterious. So I would say there are a couple ones that I read that are, you know, truly a dark academia. And if we were villains falls more under that category. I think I'll try to pass more of those kind of books over to you to see if you like them. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested in it. Okay. As far as what I read this past two weeks, I ended up reading five books. So about two books a week, which is what my normal goal is is to read two every week. So the first book I read was A Heart So Fierce and Broken by Bridget Kimmerer. This is the second book in the Curse Breakers series, the first one being... A Curse So Dark and Lonely. Yes, and I always forget what it is. And it's always easy for me to remember because it's right there in front of my face on my list of things to read. <laughs> so this is the story of Gray, who we met in the first book, and he picks up Leah Mara, who is the daughter of this opposing queen in another country who is trying to take over the land that Grey and Ren live in. But Grey is an outcast because there is a whole rumor going around that Ren is not the person who inherits the throne and that there is more of a illegitimate sort of child or person who is the true king and gray discovers that it's him we find this out at the end of the book but like honestly i'm not spoiling anything for you it's kind of there if you read the summary yeah so gray does not want ren to give up being a prince being in charge of the country so he's doing what he thinks is best and he is exiling himself to be a good guy and, you know, leave. But Ren is trying to find Grey because Grey is his friend. And there is a lot of strife and turmoil. I did not like this book as much as the first one, but I really did like it. And I really love Leah Mara as a character. She's very interesting, very strong. The way she is and the way she and Grey interact is just really... It, it just warmed my heart even more than the characters in the first book. But... The really funny story about all this is I was supposed to read the third book, which is A Thou So Bold and Deadly. Yeah. And I thought I had gotten it from NetGalley as an advanced review, but it turned out it was just an excerpt. So that kind of let me down. I can't read it until it comes <laughs> out. But I will be purchasing that book pretty much the minute it comes out and reading it. So if you want to know about book number three. And we've really enjoyed the Akatar series that is by Sarah J. Moss. Mm -hmm. How does this really compare between the two? Honestly, it is similar, but I like this series a little bit more, probably because the, there are more relatable characters to me. These characters aren't totally like super fantasy, super high fantasy like Akatar is, but these are less fantasy and more relatable characters. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Yes. That's why I kind of like it a little more. Sometimes high fantasy is very hit or miss for me because I, if I get too involved in like the magical fantasy elements and I can't follow the characters in the story, it turns me off to the story. I found when I was reading the Akatar series, it was really difficult for me to get into the characters until I reached a spot where I knew them and then I could feel for them. Right, yes. And then I cared. And there's so many of them in that series too that it's kind of hard to keep yeah, track of them. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that might be a, a good thing for the Curse Breaker series. Mm -hmm. So I gave it four stars. Like I said, I really liked it and I cannot wait for number three. Great. The second book I read is called The Ravens. This is by Danielle Page and Cass Morgan. 
It is a book about a sorority group from a college. This does fall under the dark academia gotcha. genre that we were talking about. And it is about, it comes from the perspective of two different girls. And, and since it's been so long since I read this, I cannot really remember the names of them. One of them is has been in the sorority for a while. The other one is new. And they are under the guise, the ravens, they call them the ravens, but they're under the guise of being witches. They are witches. So they're trying to hide out in the sorority. And the way it works is they have, their initiation is them trying to figure out what powers the new people have. But then they have this ceremony ritual in which they are able to share each other's power source so that they can become more powerful as a group. Gotcha. When they come together. And one of the girls goes missing. Um, so they are trying to figure out where she went because it seems like someone is trying to steal their powers. Okay. Uh, this book was not really what I thought it was going to be. It is Dark Academia and I did really like that part of it, but it was an audiobook. So there were parts of it that I forgot because when I listen to audiobooks, I listen to them at work. And sometimes I'm not totally paying attention to the audiobook. I'm paying attention, like, really focused on my task at work. So there are some spots in this book that are kind of blank for me in my head. But I thought it was an interesting book. I did give it three stars because I thought it was just an adequate read. And it was kind of fun. So I, I didn't say it was bad at all. It was just I forgot some stuff. But that's on me. How supernatural is the witchery in this? It is supernatural, but not overly involved. Gotcha. They don't spell it out in a lot of detail, which is good because I feel like it's more story based rather than super detail based, which is, I think, a very big plus selling point for this book, because if it was detailed, I wouldn't like it at all. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next, it is Green Glass House by Kate Milford. I have heard a lot of people talking about reading this book over the holidays because it takes place in a snowy scenic setting it is a middle grade book so it's for younger readers but i will say that it is very well written so even if you are not middle grade you will probably like this book there are two other books in the same universe not necessarily a series but it is in the same universe and the way that this book is set up is about a little boy i believe his name is miles who lives in a house with a lot of Green glass windows, obviously. Mm. It is a smugglers-like hotel. Not to say that only smugglers can stay there, but those are the type of people who tend to stay there. And during the winter break, hardly anyone comes because they're up in the mountains and it's snowy. So he really expects his winter vacation to be just him doing whatever he wants with no one around. Until all these people who are strangers start to show up at the house and he starts to discover that they're there for different reasons but they all have to kind of do with the house so not only is he a little miffed that his holiday is messed up a little bit but now he starts on this trip of trying to discover why they're all there and why they are being so mysterious about it he has a friend who he calls Medi and the two of them work together this was a super cute book. It was adorable. For some reason, it took me, I think this was the start of my reading slump, because even though I really loved this book, it took me a very long time to get through it because of my own personal mindset. I do really recommend this book, especially when read for a seasonal purpose. It is very cozy. Take your hot chocolate and read this book in a very comfy chair type of thing. And it being middle grade, I just think it was, it was just, it was adorable. It was just so cute. I think I, I ended up giving it three stars though, just because it took me a while to get through it. And if it was my mindset or if it was the book, I don't really know, but that's just the weird thing for me. Sometimes I'll give it a three stars, but I'll still really love the book. Yeah. I mean, if a, if a book has flaws, but you really enjoyed it, or if yeah, it just didn't connect with you. Yeah, but I do recommend it for you to read at some point. I do not know if they have it in an audiobook, but they might. So you might want to check it out and see if you like it. The fourth book um, I read is called Dating Mix Perfect. It's by Pintip Dunn. Pintip Dunn wrote a book that I was the first book that I read in 2020, which was called Malice. And if you guys are interested in that book, I mean, you know, you can find it on Goodreads and probably find my review there as well. But when I found out that Pintip Dumb was coming out with this other book, I was very, very excited because I really like her writing style. This Malice is more of a sci-fi fantasy book, whereas 
This book, Daddy Makes Perfect, is more of a contemporary, maybe even young adult romance type book. And it is about a girl who is Thai. And she has two older twin sisters who are in college. And the rule of the house is they are not allowed to date while they're in high school. So the twin sisters never dated, but then they end up going to college. And of course, they're dating all over the place. And the mom says, okay, well, when are you going to get married and give me grandchildren? And they're like, excuse me, you told us we couldn't date until we were out of high school. How are we supposed to all of a sudden be ready to get married and have babies? So the mom rethinks her policy and decides that the youngest girl is now in high school is allowed to date. But she can't really date. She has to practice date and be set up with other um, guys that are approved by the mother. And the first one that she gets approved to is her childhood friend. I think his name is Matt. And they liked each other. And then something happened where they started not being friends anymore. But because he's a close friend of the family, they now have to quote unquote date each other. And reconcile themselves with the fact that they shouldn't hate each other anymore because they have to deal with this. And he is doing it because his father basically said, if you want to take a trip through like, I think Europe and Thailand between high school and college, and you want me to pay for it, you're going to do this. So that's how he, that's his like foot in the game, basically. The really amazing thing about this book, I loved how it was written. I thought it was a lot of fun. And I really liked learning more about the Thai culture. They talk about, there's a certain festival that they talk about that they go to in this book as well. And I thought that that was really fun. They, there's a lot of talk about food, about the different Thai food and what it is in this book as well. And so I was really fascinated by all of it. Oh, it was kind of funny. There was one point where I was reading over your shoulder and it was a whole bunch of people getting together and mourning the fact that just throwing peanuts into something does not make it Thai food. Correct. Yes. <laughs> that was that was so funny. I was li- I was like kind of yeah, giggling to fun. myself. I didn't know you were reading that. But yes, that's totally totally what it was about. But yeah, I I loved this book. I gave it 4 stars. I thought it was great. Okay, how does it compare to Crazy Rich Asians? I don't know that you can compare it to Crazy Rich Good. Asians. I think it's definitely young adult in comparison to Crazy Rich Asians, but I think it's a, a ton of fun. It really is. Good. Mhm. The last book I read is a book that was given to me by an author. I have a lot of her books and I'm going through them and I made it a goal in 2021 to finish all the books that she gave me. Her name is Melanie Summers. I have already read the Royal Crazy, Crazy Royal Love series that she sent me. And uh, there were, there's a third book of that series coming out next year, but I decided to go back and read the Paradise Bay series because all the series that she writes takes place in the same universe. So even though there are three series about three different sets of people, they all take place in this universe that includes this European country called Avonia, but they don't all take place in Avonia. This one takes place in Paradise Bay, which is like an island resort that is run by a guy named Will, who is from Avonia, but he inherited this island along with his younger brother and sister. His younger brother, Will, is who we follow in the uh, Royal Crazy Love. He's the survivalist reality show dude. His sister is going to school to be a chef so that she can have a lot of experience to work at the island resort, but then they can market it as like a, you know, four or five star chef experience. I think she's more in the second book, but he runs the resort. So that's his job. His name is Harrison. Harrison is a jack of all trades, really runs the resort as if it's his family. Then there's also the woman, I don't remember what her name is, but she's from Avonia. She is getting married. And so it's her wedding day and she gets stood up at the altar and decides that because her job is to buy out hotels and resorts around the world, she has decided to combine her honeymoon with staying at this resort that that her company wants to buy out. So instead of having her honeymoon she just decides to go and have this like weepy party and then do business business as usual and in doing so kind of starts to fall in love with the resort as it is run and find a way to maybe save it at great detriment to maybe her own job or the fact that she's super depressed because she got left at the altar etc so it's like kind of that kind of story it's very short it's More of a romance series, but I loved it. I gave it four stars. And I'm going to be reading the second one next month as well. And I think that's called Whisk Away. And I think it's more about the sister in that book. 
But yeah, the Honeymooner. Did I even say what it's called? It's called the Honeymooner. That's the first one of the Paradise Bay series. Really quick question. What is what is your feelings on ever owning a bed and breakfast? Uh, I am for it, but also not for it. <laughs> <laughs> in, in theory, it is a very romanticized thing that I would love to do. But I also don't want to deal with people and people's wants and needs. I don't want to provide that for them. So I don't want to. Yeah, I feel like it's something that it just kind of glosses over all the negative aspects. Gilmore Girls does do this. Mm -hmm. And they do actually cover some of the negative aspects, but not nearly as often. Right. But I think because of Lorelai's demeanor and the way she's able to get along with people, she can do that. Yeah. We, I don't think, have the temperament to do that. No, we stress out way too much around. Uh, all right. So in total, I read, like I said, five books and 1,888 pages. So next week we will talk about total for the month. Yeah. And yeah. how much fail. How much fail I have. It's okay. The it's, there, it's, it's all validity. <laughs> it's all. Okay. So the the main reason being that work was very demanding mm. it's christmas it was christmas time right people needed us and we were there for them exactly let's talk about things we watched in the past couple weeks yeah. uh, we don't have as many as previous episodes and that's okay the first one i have to give a little bit of background about it about why we well i i don't think marshall watched it I got a free trial to Acorn TV specifically to watch a show called Stitch in Time because I have been super into the past couple months learning about period clothing and historical costuming and cosplay. For some future projects, I'm trying to learn how to make these kind of clothes inspired by, you know, pop culture and other things. So in doing so, I found this show called Stitch in Time, which is basically about a girl who is a uh, fashion historian, and she comes across a picture that's of, like a famous art piece that shows people in period dress, and they try to remake what the people are wearing or what one person is wearing in the picture, and then they do a bunch of research on the background of why the portrait was created, what was happening in the time period that it was created, etc. And one of the episodes was about a, a girl called Dido, and uh, she was a daughter of a, a slave, and the father was the ship captain. And the father found her, brought her to his father's house, and said, I want to take care of her, but because he's a ship captain, he can't keep her on the ship. So she's African American. Her family is all white. So he she lives with them, and the portrait is of her and her cousin. They're both named Elizabeth, but her date her name is Dido Elizabeth Dido Bell. So they read in her dress. I was telling my husband about this, and he said, "Oh my gosh, there's a movie about that." And I was like, "Wait, there is." So we ended up watching the movie, and it's called Bell, and it's the background of I don't know how totally accurate it is, but it is based on true events. So this girl helped influence her, not, I don't know if it was grandfather or uncle at this point, I can't remember. I want to say it's her great uncle, who is a high lord barrister. I want to say this was in Europe, but no, it had to have been. It was in Europe. So he was very instrumental in laws pertaining to eradicating the slave trade and she was kind of influencing him in that direction so that's what the movie was about what she did but that's why she's kind of a little bit famous because that's cool she is an african-american girl who is living in a white upper class life but she's not allowed to really partake she's not allowed to eat when there's formal events with the family mm. because of her skin color even though she has more money than her cousin does uh, because of all her inheritance. Like, it was really interesting to see the classes as it pertained to the race as well. So, yeah. interesting movie. Definitely check it out if you're interested in that kind of historical thing. Which I'm are... actually really interested in that series you're mentioning. I just haven't gotten the time to, to look at it. But I'm really interested more in its historical aspects and the reproduction of, mm -hmm. of classical outfits. Just because I, I sometimes wonder how much it goes into making clothes before there was sewing machines. Yeah, and I watch, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. There's actually a YouTube video 
that I watch a series and she learned how to do authentic tailoring yeah. in Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, she took lots of seminars, so she shows kind of these techniques that she's picked up, which is very fascinating. And I watch it before I go to bed because for some reason watching someone sew is just really therapeutic. <laughs> it, it, for you, yeah, I can I can totally see that as something that's therapeutic. I mm -hmm. fall asleep to people playing the same video game every day. So Exactly. Yeah. So we only watched two more holiday movies this past couple of weeks, Christmas Vacation and The Holiday, which, Marshall, you did not watch The Holiday with us. I, I think, didn't, but although it, it was on my list. There is, however, one movie we watched that's not technically classified as a holiday movie, but for us, we have to watch it Christmas Eve. So we had Christmas Vacation, we had The Holiday, we also have Hook. Oh, I forgot to write that down. Yes, we also watched Hook. And that is our classic Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. <laughs> it, it's it's the time right before Christmas that we all get together and we all make fart yeah. jokes. Yeah. So those are the three like holiday movies. I don't know if we really need to talk about that because they're classics, you know. Yeah, I, I yeah. think everybody knows these. I did a little research on the holiday just because I was looking stuff up. Is because there were all the different houses, and apparently one of the places where I think it's Cameron Diaz and June Law go to eat. The outside was filmed in the same place that they filmed the school in Gilmore Girls. So mm. I was like, that's an interesting little tidbit that they did there. Also, we finished Mandalorian, as I'm sure everyone else uh. did. And how did you feel about that ending? Okay. I felt like it was a good wrap up to the series, although it may not necessarily be done. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. Yeah. There is a lot of ground left to cover. And from some of the things that I'm hearing, the, the bombs that they dropped in that episode are going to be used not to rewrite the events of the sequel trilogy, but to give context to it. Right. Some of the things that even the actors were like, why are my characters doing this? Well, now we're going to have a good explanation of it. I think where Disney is going with these series is good. Right. Yes. How did you feel about that? Um, I thought it, I liked the ending, although it made me a little bit sad because if we don't get more Grogu, I'm going to probably be done mm. with this. But, um, yeah. the uh, action is not always my thing. I was a little bored as I, as I usually am with some Mandalorian scenes, but not all. Some, they are entertaining or entertaining action, but in this case, this, I was a little bit bored. But I thought it was cool the way everybody came together and did their own thing to try to get in to rescue Grogu. So that was fine. I, I really liked the symbolism of the fight between Moff Gideon and the Mandalorian and Mando because of the weapons they were using to fight each other mm. were both representative of different aspects of Mandalorian culture. Right. And that's really what this episode was all about. It's what really is Mandalore. Mm -hmm. And that's like something that was so key underlying in it that right. I thought was really interesting. Hmm. We also rented a few movies, my husband and I, to watch right before Christmas. He got Tenet, which he has seen in the theater. And I was very excited to see on my TV because I heard the sound was horrible in the theater. And we were able to watch it with captioning and a sound bar. So we actually understood what was happening. And the movie itself was filmed very well. The actual storyline was interesting. But what really killed me about this movie it were the plot holes. There were certain like rules that you have to follow in this movie in order for it to be successful. Things that were pointed out as rules that needed to happen... Yeah. In specific timelines, it is like kind of a it's kind of a time travel thingy in a way that were broken all over the place. And that really irritated me, especially in a movie like this where it's not always specific what is happening and you're trying to figure it out. When they give you things for a plot in order to make their part of the story be told more dynamically and more exciting, but yet it doesn't follow the rules that they themselves have set up. To me, that kind of hurts what is happening in the mm -hmm. movie. And that happened a lot in this movie, and it hurt my head a lot. I will say the first 10 minutes of this movie had me very intrigued. Would I watch this movie again? Yes, I would. 
I would watch it with Marshall and have him also pick it apart with me because my head hurt so badly after watching this movie, not just because of the sound, but also because of sitting there trying to intently figure out what was happening in this movie. I understood the movie. I understood the plot of the movie. I understood what was going on. But because of what happens in this movie, the way that the time travel happens, it hurt my head. (laughs) I have always had a love-hate relationship with time travel and fiction, Mm -hmm. typically because the way that it goes about doing its thing makes no logical sense once you put half of a lick of sense into it. The only time that I have really seen it where I was like, okay, I have no holes in this story was actually Endgame. Yeah. I have no problems with how Endgame does it. Because they kind of dealt with all of the things. Yeah, the more complex you get, the harder it is to keep it together. Yeah. And Endgame didn't go complex. It went a lot simple, and I think that I, I appreciated It dealt that. with a lot of different timelines that were there, mm-hmm. but it just said, okay, there are all these timelines. Yeah, we don't need to actually watch you go and deal with all these timelines and mm-hmm. resolve them. We just say, you did it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Alternatively, we got a movie that was kind of underhyped, in my opinion, called Love and Monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, Marshall did watch this with me and Corey. It is the story of kind of this nuclear holocaust, in a way, like a post-apocalyptic where there's an asteroid coming to Earth and they have to eradicate the asteroid and they decide to send up nuclear weapons, which in turn causes radiation, which causes animals and insects to become deadly large man hunting eaters specifically it works on cold-blooded organisms yeah and it was really interesting because like they literally launched all the nukes so this was not a nuclear holocaust it was just an apocalypse of monsters Mm -hmm. and then all the people that survived went into these underground bunkers that are constantly being attacked and they have to survive down there and the story follows one guy And his attempt to get back to his high school girlfriend, Mm -hmm. who's in another bunker seven days away by foot with monsters. But it's been seven years, too, since they Mm -hmm. shot the asteroids. So a lot of time has passed and he doesn't he's been trying to find her, hasn't been able to, but finally does. So that's when he decides to go. And meet up with her. But he hasn't been above ground. He's not part of the scouting party ever. So he has to learn how to protect himself. And he has a problem that he he's he freezes up. For a specific reason that yeah. they tell you about in there. Yeah. It's kind of important to the plot a little bit. I thought it was cute and fun. It reminds me a lot of like zombie stuff except with insects large insects if you liked zombie land you'll definitely like this movie mm-hmm. there is some creepy crawliness going on because there's lots of bugs that are really mm-hmm. big but how did you feel about that at first i i was a little like weirded out by it but as the movie went on it wasn't as bad as i anticipated mm-hmm. so i think it was okay there are some gross parts if you don't like big bugs you will not like this movie but it, it's not as horrible as I thought it was going to be. And the plot was, I, I thought the plot was excellent. Right. They, it didn't really end either the way I thought that they were going to end it, which is great. It was not cliched at the end, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the very last movie we're going to talk about is the one that's been most anticipated for over a year. And we watched it last night and it's called Wonder Woman 84. I'm trying to figure out where I start on this because I liked it. Me too. Did not like it as much as the first one. But liked it. Liked it more than everyone else seems to like it. Because a lot of people are really dissing this movie. They said they were disappointed. I understand where their disappointment comes from. But for me personally, I I understood where they were trying to go with it. There were a couple boring parts. It wasn't yeah. like go, go, go. My favorite part, this is not a spoiler. But um, there's a part where Chris Pine is trying on clothes. <laughs> from 1984 and uh just <laughs> having the best time <laughs> with his fashion and, and she's like of course very classically you know she's a she's a snazzy dressed woman very like modern simplistic and he comes in with all these like fashion trends and she's like no 
No, no. <laughs> and from what I understood, his lines in that scene were all ad lib. Right. So, like, that's really just Chris Pine just being a dork. Which I love. I so love Chris fun. Pine. He's he's so funny. Yeah. Um, does I, not take himself seriously, which I appreciate. Yeah, because this character couldn't take himself seriously, no. not in this setting. No. No. I felt like this movie, at, we were talking about this at the end. This movie mm-hmm. was very prescient. I feel like this movie, even though its release was way delayed, when it came out, it felt like the climax of the movie was where we are right now. Mm-hmm. And... A lot of this movie is about taking the shortcut to getting what you want. And the answer being more, more, more. And that's what this movie was all about and what the real problem with all that is. And what's that brought us in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the climax was excellent. A little bit cheese, but very good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Lastly, we're going to talk about some video games, regular games, some lifestyle things that we either got for Christmas or are enjoying right now. First off, let's talk about a board game we played during Christmas. It's called Code Names. And this is the Harry Potter version of Code Names. Right. But it's got a lot in common with the original, so it it translates. Mm-hmm. So Code Names is this game where you have a layout of tiles. And you have to get your partner to guess the correct tiles without guessing any of the very wrong tiles. Mm -hmm. And you'll do this by giving them a clue, kind of like Pyramid, $10,000 Pyramid, Mm -hmm. and telling them how many different tiles on there you intended this clue to to indicate. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is entirely cooperative. Right. And I loved it. Yeah. You weren't like competitive or anything. You do have a partner and there are kind of teams, but you're not competitive teams. We are just like teams within a large group of people trying to to accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. We played it with my father and our friend Jose. And I was on one side of the table with Jose where Lainey was with our father. Uh, Jose and our dad, they they know Harry Potter, but not really into it. We're mm-hmm. really into it. So Lainey was my partner. Right. And I think this worked really well, even for the other half of the table. Mm-hmm. They knew what they were doing because they just keyed in on what was in the pictures. Whereas Marshall and I keyed in more on... Things we knew in the Harry Potter universe and could be like, oh, this is mm-hmm. this is the clue. And we'd be like, oh, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Because exactly. we were a little more into it, yeah. And there is some more modes of play. We didn't get into it. We only played it like a couple times. Right. But I think this is a really fun, excellent game and it feels good. Yeah. Once, once you get, once you understand the rules, it feels good. And even my mom who was standing, who was sitting there watching, normally because she feels like she can't pick up on these games fast enough. Was sitting there like, ooh, ooh, I want to do this, but we didn't have enough players to have it be even. So, so she would give us a clue at the end and be like, "I chose these two. Yeah, let's see if it works." Yeah, so that was kind of fun as well. So yeah. I, I recommend, you know, at least the code names Harry Potter, but I bet you since code names is very similar, um, I think there's also a Disney version as well. But mm-hmm. I recommend for even like young kids because if they can identify what's happening in the picture, then they can play the game. It's yeah. not, it's not that hard, really. It's a good family game. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about video games uh, that we got for Christmas or Mm -hmm. intending to get. uh, Because I have had my Switch for more than a year. I got Animal Crossing when it first came out in March um, because I used to play New Leaf and I had to get the new one. Um, And then, of course, the Animal Crossing hype blew up. Um, And so Marshall has been trying to get a Switch for a long time. Finally got one this Mm -hmm. month. And I got it like a... A full month before I was thinking I was going to. Yeah, because it was it it actually came in like there was we thought there was going to be a shipping delay, so he also bought Animal Crossing as well to play. So of course this left it wide open to get some more Switch games that we could play. Our, our friend Jose also has a Switch, so 
we were able to play all of us different games together. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the games that he gave me, which I had never heard of before, is Agatha Christie, The ABC Murders, which is probably perfect for me because I love mysteries and I love Agatha Christie. So I haven't really played this game yet and I need to soon, but it's an adventure inspired by the Agatha Christie novel, The ABC Murders, you're supposed to chase a serial killer who's hiding behind the ABC signature. It says inspect crime scenes, interview suspects, and analyze evidence you have created. So I'm excited to start this one. I think it was a really great, like, unknown game for me. For for him to get it, I thought was really amazing because I, since I had never heard of it, and when I, when I saw it, I was like, yes. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect game. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that we also got, this was one that was addressed to both of us from Santa. Pretty certain that means you got it, Lainey. I did buy it, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was Super Mario Party. Now, I've never actually really played a Mario Party game. Right. But I've I been either. interested in it. And I know you've played them before, and you kind of had some difficulty I because did. of really I think I remember players. that I did have difficulties with the people because the people playing it were mean. So <laughs> I I don't like playing when there are people who are overly competitive or mean or specifically try to spite you when you're playing. I like playing for fun when I'm playing with other people, which is why Splatoon was so fun when it first came out. And then when people figured out how to play it and just defeat you two seconds in, I, I lost the fun of playing Splatoon. Yeah. Here with this game, we were playing with Jose for our first playthroughs, mm-hmm. and we we dealt with a lot of the competitive issues by saying, okay, whatever happens, the NPC must die. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I think it, it was just so fun and laid back, and there's a lot of mini games in there mm-hmm. that I really enjoyed the play of it. Mm-hmm. It was very dif- different. You don't have to be go, go, go the whole time, which I appreciated. There was a lot of luck, a lot of chance. There was a little bit of strategy, but having strategy didn't necessarily make it so that you would win or dominate or be able to annihilate the other players, which I did I did appreciate. In the earlier Mario Party, it was a lot easier to annihilate the other players if you picked like one specific character who was just levels above everybody else and you and you knew it, you could take advantage of that. In this game, I don't really feel like you have that too much. Yeah, I feel like the characters are somewhat balanced, but they're also very themed. So right. you played as Rosalina, who is a princess, and some of her things just gave her more money. Right. Where I played as a shy guy who is just barely above average constantly. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think it was pretty good. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I can't wait to see what other you know, levels other characters might be as we pick it. Yeah. I think it's a great party game. We, I think between all of us, we had like eight controllers total because we have a couple extra sets of Joy-Con controllers. So we could, you know, I don't know how many players you can play. I think up to four, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Which is fine. We played three and that was fun. And when you bring two Switches together with Super Mario Party, you can actually dock them right next to each other physically and mm. they'll they'll actually change the game board layout. Oh, nice. So you can go, this switch is laid out this way, and this one is laid out this way, and now the board looks like an L, and it shows up on the screen. That oh, way. that's cool. Yeah. So then the other game, and this was one that Lainey gave me, it's another Mario game, but it's one that I've been watching so much gameplay of, and I really like the first one. It is Mario Maker 2. And now Mario Maker 2 has got all of its DLC out, and there's... It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always been really into game design, and this is a game that's really for me. But they've added a lot more multiplayer stuff. So I could build a nice, fun, easy level, and Lainey could play it alongside me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm not really into that kind of thing, but I know Marshall is. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to get it for him. So hopefully you can build some really fun levels with that. One of the games that I ended up buying because it was like 80% off, like a lot of the games on the Switch... Um, are currently, at least for a few more days, 
80% off. I got the, I love the Lego games and I played mostly all of them, but the one that I didn't have yet was DC Lego Super Villains. And I got a bundle of it and all of the downloadable content that comes with it that give you extra levels of play and extra character packs. I ended up getting it for like 18 bucks, maybe it was 15, I can't remember, but I knew it was under $20 for something that would normally cost like almost $80. So I was like, this is worth it. So I ended up getting that one so I could play it also just in my spare time, although I'm still playing through Paper Mario Origami King. I'm still kind of playing through that as well. So that is probably I will finish first before I play this one. Okay. You know, you got some credit for your Switch games. Yeah. What are you planning to get with that? One of the things that I'm planning on getting, although I'm going to play through the demo of it first, is Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. It's another Zelda game, and I'm a big fan of Zelda. I'm wearing a Zelda shirt right now. And the only thing that I'm kind of like iffy on it, I played the original Hyrule Warriors and it was fun, but it's completely non-canon. Something about that doesn't really sit well with me. Uh, this one may be more canon than the first one was. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how I feel about it. Gotcha. And gotcha. then I'm going to, I'm probably going to buy it. Okay. So just a couple more lifestyle things I wanted to bring up. The first one is... I did get two the owl crates for December, and one of them is fantastic, and the other one is great. Uh, we're going to be posting pictures sometime this week of owl crate on my Instagram, Zany Laney. If you want to go over there and see what I got, it is uh, ah, I love this box so much. It like speaks to me in every way possible. So please go over there and check those out. Their other lifestyle thing that I have is, you know, it's, we still wear masks when we go outside. I personally had a concert, choir concert that I had to wear a mask in, but I wanted to wear lipstick. And as we all know, it's very hard to wear makeup and lipstick when you're wearing a mask because it definitely rubs off on your mask. So I've been on this like drive to find a lipstick that is kiss proof, waterproof, won't smudge on my mask. And also is red, which is so weird because I used to hate red lips. Mm. And now I'm like totally into it, especially since I've been into historical costuming. I've totally been into a red lip and I've been surprised about how a red lip will really make me feel better if I pop it on. Almost like I'm all of a sudden fancy. And, you know, even if I don't go out, I, I feel more fancy, which is great. So my favorite one that I found is the Stila Stay All Day Red Lip in Beso. Um, it's like the liquid lipstick. And... I got it for super cheap during Christmas for 10 bucks. Usually it's about 20 bucks, but I got it for $10 and I thought that was a, a fantastic price. And so I got that one and it did not smudge. It did not get over. And my, the back of my mask was white and it did not get on it at all. I do have an honorable mention drugstore. If you're looking for one, it is the L'Oreal Infallible Pro Matte Liquid Lipstick. And the shade is, and I can't read it because it's always so small, Frambois Frenzy. There you go. Frambois Frenzy. <laughs> uh, and that one's a really nice red as well. Um, if you're looking for red, it is a little bit sticky and it doesn't stay on as long as the Stila, but it is good as well. Okay. So that just about wraps us up. That does. Thank you for listening to us at Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things that we talked about in today's podcast. Find Lainey on at Zany Laney, or me at One True Hazard. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics you want to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. Until next time, geek out.